Today, we commemorate the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we do so by standing in solidarity with all those with whom he stood. In the summer of 1968, scant months after the murder and martyrdom of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., these words from the King James translation of the Bible appeared on a tent in the Poor People's Campaign Resurrection City occupying the mall in Washington, D.C. Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Let us pray. The God of dreamers and prophets, unveil our eyes to show us the world as it is and unveil our hearts to show us the world as it may be. Amen. Once upon a time, there were two sisters. They were tricked by their father into marrying the same man. One sister loved the man deeply and found her love returned. The other sister was trapped in a loveless marriage but the unloved sister was fertile. That mattered in her world, and it still matters in our world, although in different ways. The beloved sister was infertile until the birth of a particularly beloved boy, and ultimately died birthing her second son years later. But in the interval between those births, her firstborn son was the apple of his father's eye and the pride of his life and loins, given his great age. The text tells us that Israel, formerly Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the child of his old age. Perhaps he also held him so dearly because he was at long last the child of his beloved Rachel, for whom he stayed for the promise of marrying. He loved her so much that he worked seven years of manual labor and then another seven years finding that they passed overnight because of his love and longing. Yet, between the desperate fertility of his first wife, Leah, and her sister, uh, and the, all of the enslaved women that she, Leah, and her sister, Rachel, gave their shared husband to impregnate, and then finally, Rachel herself, between all of these women and all of these pregnancies, Israel had 11 sons and some unknown number of daughters, with the birth of Joseph. All of them knowing their father loved little Joseph more than he would ever love any of them. It seems Israel Jacob learned nothing from having his love manipulated by his father-in-law, or perhaps he just learned all the wrong lessons. His children's hunger for their father's love was a hunger that could never be satisfied. The brothers turned mean and bitter and dangerous. The sisters were ignored by a narrative tradition that often, but not always, expects them to remain on the margins unless essential to the story and never once mentions a father's love for a daughter. Uh, thus it was that this one boy was a treasure and treated as one, he alone of all his siblings. Uh, he was dressed so elaborately that his richly embroidered tunic would come to be known as the garments worn by the daughters of kings. Uh, 400 years later, as the story goes, David's daughters wore them as well. Oh yes, Joseph wore a princess dress and like many who stand out in some visible way, Joseph was the victim of bullying. And he was also a little snot. He was no prince, no matter the outcome of his life. However, a person does not have to be a prince or a perfect son for their life to matter. They can have bad habits and bad attitudes and still be worthy of the life God gave them. And no one has the right to take that life away, no matter how hurt, how angry, how bitter, how betrayed. Joseph was the baby 
He was his father's pet and that did not sit well with his older brothers. He was also an annoying little brother following his big brothers around and that didn't sit well with them either. He was where they did not want him to be, where they did not think he belonged. Uh, some folks still think this is justification for killing a person, hounding and hunting them down. And then add to it all, Joseph was a tattletale. He would go home to his father and tell on his brothers and get them in trouble. Now, this may sound like just the sibling rivalry with which you and I and so many others grew up with, but there is something uglier about this family. These hurts ran deep and they ran long. And when we arrive at the episode, including the tattletelling, Joseph is 17 years old. He is fully a man in his culture, and all of his big brothers are older than that. These are men and not boys, but they carry the unhealed hurts of childhood into their adulthood, and the hurt, harm, and havoc they will wreak will bear the strength and consequence of their adult responsibilities to manage their own pain without making it someone else's. Their acts will not be childish pranks. They will be crimes, assault, kidnapping, trafficking, conspiracy to commit murder. This is not a children's Bible story. And then as if Joseph's favorite status and clothing allowance were not enough, he also seemed to be God's favorite among them, gifted with the power of dreams, gifted to dream portentous dreams, and gifted to interpret, interpret his dreams and the dreams of others. And oh, his, his dreams were mighty grand. They were grand because he was not simply a dreamer or dream interpreter, but he was the master of dreams according to the Hebrew text. His dreams signified that his status and his story would be even greater, greater than those of his brothers and even greater than those of his parents, including his father who once wrestled with God. Oh, his brothers decided then and there that there was no room in the world for Joseph and his dreams. They decided that they had the right to kill and enslave anyone who had a different dream than theirs. Their descendants in this world are still dreaming up nightmares for those who dream of a different world. In order for their dreams to come back, come to pass, Joseph had to die and hopefully take his dreams with him. They said to one another, look, here comes this dreamer, this master of dreams. Come on, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and then we will say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Uh, Joseph's dreams upset the social order, the world they knew and the world they wanted. The world in which they knew their place, his place, and everyone else's place. Uh, Joseph and his dreams were dangerous. And now in the world of the text, Joseph's dream was not seen as collaboration with an imperializing power upholding the hierarchy of scarcity and enabling perpetuating slavery. It was seen as a come up. He was raised up so that he might raise his people up, but of course the story ends with their enslavement by the very same mechanisms he set in place to enslave the Egyptians. Oh, no, I'm not here to defend Joseph's dream, uh, just his right to have it and go on living with it. Dreams and their dreamers can be dangerous, especially to entrenched realities. Everyone knows that the older brother is the most important. Everyone knows that the younger brother is least significant. Everyone knows that sisters and daughters don't matter enough to have their names mentioned unless there is a sexual element to the story. And everyone knows that women are there to give birth to and introduce the men who matter and move the story along. These are some of the entrenched realities in the world of the scriptures. 
except for those dreamers and their dreams who saw a new way of being in the world. Women who did not know their place or knew it and told you what you could do with it. Younger siblings who turned the table on older siblings. Enslaved people who knew that freedom was their right. Uh, uppity shepherd boys facing down an army in which every soldier might as well have been a giant. Wild-eyed desert wanderers, pregnant virgins, rabbis on the get down with sex workers and financial frauds. Some were called seers. Some were called visionaries. Some were called prophets. Some were called psalmists. Some were called wise women. Some were called whores. Some were called disciples. Some were called bandits and revolutionaries. One was called teacher, healer, savior, and redeemer. Mary's baby. In the words of the Emmaus Road travelers, Jesus the Nazarene, a prophet mighty in deed and word before God. All were dreamers of one sort or another. But the greatest dreamer of them all is God, the God who wove her dreams into reality using the flesh and blood of a virgin's womb. Jesus is the dream of God, and like Joseph's dream, he presented a danger to the entrenched realities of his world. Unlike Joseph, Jesus came to overthrow empires and their emperors and usher in a sovereign majesty that could never be fully contained in a theological theologically impoverished word like kingdom. And with God, through God, and as God, Jesus dreamed of a world free from sin, fear, and death. Jesus, just when his community of dreamers was catching fire with the spirit of the dream, the destroyers of the dream said, look, uh, here comes this dreamer, this master of dreams. Come, let us kill him, and then we shall see what will become of his dreams. It, it was to this brokenhearted community of dreamers that Jesus appears on the Emmaus Road. Uh, their dream has become a nightmare. They saw their dreamer martyred and murdered before their very eyes. They could still hear the echo of the hammer ringing against the nails and the mocking cries, where is your dreamer now? Where is his dream? Will it come down from heaven to save him? They could still taste and smell the scent of blood on the air. They could still see the moment when that tortured and twisted body breathed its last and the dream died before their very eyes. Their dreamer and his dream died on the dead wood of a dead tree. And as they walked along in the company of a seemingly clueless stranger, they were relieving the, reliving the death of that dream. Now, as on Good Friday, before we move to the resurrection of the dream, we need to sit in the dust and ashes of grief with our clothing and hair torn and in disarray like our shredded hopes and broken hearts. Jesus' death offers hard lessons for today's dreamers. The innocent do suffer. The wheels of justice in this world grind the innocent and the guilty into the ground without distinction. The whims of an evil empire are born on the broken bodies of its subjects whose race, ethnicity, and embodiment differ from their own. Broken hearted mothers are faced with the burial of their two young children, mutilated corpses, bullet ridden bodies the ones you thought were there to serve and protect you, all too often protect a dream that does not include you. The people in the places we pray will turn on us as soon as we preach a gospel. That is not their gospel. Friends you have known for years will leave you to die in your own spittle but your girls will stand with you to the very end. For all that Jesus was and is God's incarnate dream, the world still needs dreamers. God calls us to dream with her, to make her dreams for the world present in our reality, her dream of a beloved community where the only law is love. And that is a dangerous dream. 
His dreamers have been hounded and hunted in every time and every place, and more than a few have died a martyr's death. Here in these disunited states where there is justice for none while there is only liberty for some, no matter the two or three righteous convictions, the dreamers have been indigenous peoples praying to and naming God in their own ways. The trafficked survivors of slavers deposited in a strange land to be bought and sold and worked like cattle, yet lusted after and violated. The dreamers are those ground down by structural, economic, social, and racial injustice. The dreamers are those whose bodies are not recognized as the very image of God because the language of their dreams transcends the binary grammatical languages of ancient dreamers. The dreamers are those whose love and families are disdained because their dream of love expands the categories of love and family and marriage. Some of those dreamers are Jews who seek to live and worship in peace, but are increasingly subject to anti-Semitism, including from Christians and the worst of our theology. The dreamers are those who believe housing and health care ought not be dreams. The dreamers are migrants and man-made, yes, man-made and not human-made, borders all around this good but troubled land. And yet we still dream. And every now and then, one dreamer's voice issues a clarion call in gathering all of the other dreamers for this mighty work of God. Dreamers like Miriam and Martin, Deborah and Desmond, Polly and Paul, Cesar Chavez and the Shunammite women, Harvey Milk and Hogla Milka and their sisters. God still sends prophets and dreamers. Just sometimes the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and the tenement halls. They are found in rap lyrics embroidered with profanity and they come from the mouths of babes and God still calls, dream a little dream with me.